It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, my first question this morning is uh, to the Premier. For weeks, we've been hearing disturbing de details of the ongoing crisis in hallway medicine. Hospitals regularly operating above 100 per cent capacity. Patients being treated in hallways and going days without basics like a shower. One woman in Ottawa trapped in hospital for two years, waiting for home care supports. Despite this crisis, last spring's budget laid out a plan for spending restraint in the health care sector, including a plan to hold funding below the rate of inflation over the next three years. That plan remains unchanged. When does the Premier plan to fix this and start to take on the hallway medicine crisis that was left by the Liberals? Questions for the Premier. Minister of Health. Heard to the Minister of Health. Official opposition. While we can certainly agree on one thing, that we were left a huge mess by the previous government that did basically nothing over 15 years, led to this crisis of hallway health care. It didn't just spring up overnight. It's been building and building and building for years. But we promised the people of Ontario that we would do something about it. And as you heard in the fall economic statement yesterday, we are adding $1.9 billion more into the health care budget this year than last year. We are also transforming our health care system into one that's truly patient-centered, that brings in the latest technology and the latest techniques, and is going to work to break down that number of people receiving health care in hallways. It's not acceptable. We are working on a number of fronts to deal with that. I'll have more to say on that in the supplemental. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, there is absolutely no doubt in anybody's mind that the Liberals— I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. The member for Don Valley East will come to order. I can hear you. I apologize to the Leader of the Opposition. I'll give you Thank you, Speaker. There's no doubt that the Liberals left to health care hanging by a thread, but the Premier seems to think a status quo of cuts is good enough. Can the Premier confirm that despite hospitals in Brampton, Sudbury, Hamilton and Markham operating above 100 per cent capacity, and independent reports confirming hallway medicine will grow worse if the government fails to take action, the Ford government is still offering hospitals hundreds of million dollars less than the amount necessary to prevent further deterioration in the hospital system? Thank you. Uh, well, it is important to stick to the facts, and the facts are that we are increasing funding, as I indicated before, by $1.9 billion this year over last year. That's a 3.1 per cent increase. We have added $384 million this year to hospitals' operating funds, to, in addition to $68 million that has been divided up among small to medium-sized hospitals that had a structural funding deficit due to a funding formula that was put in place by the previous government. They didn't do anything Order. about it to fix it, but we are. Those small and medium-sized hospitals are very happy to receive the funds that they have. They're using that to reduce hallway health care, as we are across many, many um, priorities that we're putting in place. We have tried to move people into uh, reactivation care centres. We are moving some people who are alternate level of care into retirement homes with Response. appropriate home care supports. We've also invested an additional $155 million into home and community care, which is also a key part of the, the solution to this problem when people don't need to be in hospital. Thank you very much. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, health care inflation runs at about 4.3 per cent, and this government is funding health care at 1.6 per cent increase. That means a serious cut to our health care services in this province. And you know what? For, for patients caught waiting in hospital hallways, the, the new Ford government looks a lot like the old Ford government. It's the same Premier making the same cuts and taking the crisis in hallway medicine that the Liberals left us from bad to worse. Can the Premier explain how he plans to move patients out of hospital hallways when his plan, like the Liberals before him, consists of health care funding that doesn't keep pace with patient needs of an aging population? Minister of Health. 
Well, as you know, we are introducing a system transformation in our health care system, and it's not always hospitals where patients need to receive care. That's why we are investing across the board in home and community care supports as well, so that people don't need to end up coming back into hospital time and time again. The best example of that is in mental health and addictions care, where we see the same people in many, many hospitals circling in and out because they don't know where else to go when they have a mental health emergency or crisis. If they're fe feeling suicidal, they go to the hospital emergency department. It should never get to that, and that is why we are coming forward with a comprehensive mental health and addictions plan that will ensure that people can receive the mental health care they need in the community before it ever reaches that crisis point. That's why investments in both hospital care and home and community care Response. are so important. The next question, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier. Uh, parents and students are also concerned about cuts in the classroom and the quality of their education. Students are seeing course options disappear. Teachers and education workers are disappearing with them. Can the Premier confirm the government is still on track to fire 10,000 teachers? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Education. Urge to the Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Finance reaffirmed that this government is absolutely and firmly committed to the maintenance and the defence and improvement of public education in the province of Ontario by uh, a plan to invest an additional $200 million more, a historic investment, the highest levels ever recorded in provincial history to support our young people. Mr. Speaker, this is in addition to $500 million to rebuild schools, in addition to our plan to invest $200 million to increase math scores over the next four years. Mr. Speaker, our plan is working. It is helping to ensure young Young people are able to achieve their potential and get good jobs in the labour market. That's our vision. That's our aspiration. We're going to keep working hard to ensure every student succeeds in this province. Here. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, apparently yesterday in estimates, this minister actually confirmed that they're on track to ditch 10,000 uh, teachers out of the education Order. system in Ontario. The Ford government Order. was clear in last spring's budget, and that plan did not change yesterday, Speaker. Over the next four years, Order. the government plans to hold education funding below the rate of inflation, even if it means school roofs will continue to leak. Courses will continue to disappear, and 10,000 teachers will lose jobs. If the Premier has a different plan, when is he going to reveal it? Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. To the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, this year we intend to spend $1.2 billion more than we spent last year in the defence and the improvement of public education. Let, let those facts let those facts permeate the debate. Mr. Speaker, our plan is to get labour deals, as we've done in our agreement with CUPE that has restored over 1,000 frontline workers in schools in every region of this province. Mr. Speaker, my aim as the minister, in, in conjunction with the leadership of our premier, is to make sure our students remain in class. That's the first point of this discussion. We are working hard, in good faith, so that parents know with confidence that we're going to continue to keep their kids in mind and keep them in class so they can focus, they can learn, and they can get a good job at the end of their journey. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, delaying and repackaging cuts does not make them go away, and it does nothing to reverse the deep cuts to public services and the harm that they've already done. The Ford government's plan will mean fewer courses for students, fewer teachers in schools, and a backlog of school repairs that keeps growing. If the Premier is genuinely interested in cleaning up the mess left by the Liberals, will he stop trying to repackage cuts, actually reverse them, and work with parents and teachers to improve the quality of education in our schools? Minister. Oh, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, um, I think it is important for families at home to know the investments we are making to just to debunk the narrative of that question. Mr. Speaker, we intend to spend $1.2 billion more than we did last year. We have doubled the mental health envelope from the, the peak of Liberal spending on the former government. We're spending the most, over $3.1 billion, the highest levels for special education needs, the highest levels for transportation, the highest levels for First Nation education. Mr. Speaker, our plan is to invest in the areas of need. We're helping our kids achieve their potential. We're doing it through investments, but we're also doing it, Mr. Speaker, through a modernization of our curriculum, because we know that young people need to have the core competencies and able to succeed with their careers in the job market. We're going to continue to focus on those investments, on improving our schools, updating our curriculum, and giving young people the tools to succeed in life. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is uh, to the Premier. Amidst growing concern about the climate emergency, Ontarians are desperate 
for real action from their government. Can the Premier explain why the $50 million budget cut to the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks announced in last spring's budget grew even deeper in the fall economic statement and is now a $76 million cut to environment and conservation programs? Questions to the Premier. Minister of Environment. Referred to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thanks very much uh, to the member opposite for that question. But uh, I want to be clear with the member opposite and the members of this House that there is not a reduction in environmental programs or productions. This is a part of the broader effort to centralize money and be more efficient and effective in the delivery of government services. There is no impact to the ministry's services and the delivery of our mandate. The $25 million decrease to the ministry's funding is due to the centralization of several government services. The centralization of these internal government services impacts all ministries, not just the Ministry of Environment. The funding has been reallocated to other ministries and therefore fiscally neutral to this government. Mr. Speaker, the member ought to be rest assured that we will continue to protect the environment, implement our environment plan for Ontario, and ensure there's a healthy balance between a healthy economy and a healthy environment. Thank you very much. Supplementary question. Well, Speaker, when it comes to responding to the climate crisis, people were desperate for a change, but sadly, they see the same Ford government fighting in court against putting a price on pollution, spending millions on partisan ad campaigns promoting climate denial, threatening small businesses with fines if they fail to promote their partisan campaigns. And now we see even deeper cuts to environmental initiatives. Why is this Premier going to war against the environment? Question to refer to the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And since we were elected last June, we've moved forward with the plan for the environment for Ontario to not only balance the healthy economy, but also balance uh, the environment as well, Mr. Speaker. And it's interesting that it comes from the member opposite, whose, whose party in the last election didn't even mention climate change once, Mr. Speaker. We are moving forward with changes. Mr. Speaker, just this morning, for the member opposite's interest, we announced our new impact, uh, climate impact assessment across this province. What this will do will analyze different parts of the province so we know where uh, impact to climate change is going to occur and how municipalities, communities, Indigenous communities and people can take focus on what to prioritize in order to deal with climate change, to adapt, in order to uh, ensure that as the changes grow in, in the climate change emergency that's going on, Mr. Speaker, that we uh, take forth the changes that are necessary and Spons. put priorities into what projects we're putting forth in our communities so that, Mr. Speaker, we can become more resilient to climate change and better prepared for the upcoming changes. But we will continue to uh, uh, produce our Maine and Ontario Environment Plan. The next question, the member for Burlington. <laughs> Speaker, my question is to the Premier. When our government was first elected, we inherited a dangerous fiscal and economic situation. The people of this province were struggling. They were being squeezed by higher gas prices, more taxes, and skyrocketing electricity costs. They were working harder, paying more, and getting less. Speaker. When it came to the vital services that the people required, we inherited a broken system from the previous government. Whether it was hallway health care, declining mass scores, overcrowded transit systems, and congested highways. Premier, can you speak to the vision and plan that our government has laid out in the fall economic statement that is helping to turn this province around? The question is addressed to the Premier. Well, I, I want to thank our all-star MPP from the great city of Burlington. What an incredible job she's doing, Mr. Speaker. Our, our government's plan is a balanced and prudent and thoughtful approach to governing, which puts more money into people's pockets, Mr. Speaker. We're investing $1.3 billion more in critical public services this year alone, Mr. Speaker, increasing health care by $1.9 billion, education by $1.2 billion, Mr. Speaker. We inherited a $15 billion disaster deficit on the backs of the people of Ontario. Our deficit now stands at $9 billion, Mr. Speaker. That's $1.3 billion lower 
than the 10.3 of last year. Mr. Speaker, our government has proved that we can be Response. fiscally responsible and very thoughtful when it comes to health care education and creating 272,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. Our economy is booming because of the pulp. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you for the response, Premier, and for your strong leadership. Ontario is truly turning around economically because of the strong and prudent plan that has been laid out, and we are already seeing the results of our plan come to fruition. 272,000 new net jobs were formed government in 2000, uh, 2018, 80,000 new self-employed, and 41,000 public sector positions have been created this year alone. Premier, can you elaborate on the, uh, the other measures that our government has announced that will help to make life more affordable for the people of this province? The Premier. I want to thank our MPP for the great question. Mr. Speaker, for Northerners, we are pro pro proposing to reduce the aviation fuel tax, saving money for individuals and families on vital issues like groceries and travel costs, Mr. Speaker. It's putting more money in the pockets of the people of the North. Our government is making life easier for families by letting kids ride free on GO trains and buses. We're helping over 100,000 low-income seniors by providing them with free, publicly paid dental care. Mr. Speaker, providing free museum admissions for young people, proposing uh, to cut small business taxes by 8.7 percent. Small businesses are the backbone of our economy, Mr. Speaker, and they have been crushed for the last 15 years. Finally, they're seeing the light. They are so grateful for our policies. That's putting $1,500 in the pockets of small businesses, Mr. Speaker, and we're also saving the taxpayers. The taxpayers of this province, three billion dollars back into the pockets of the great people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can it stop the clock? <laughs> the House will come to order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Just this morning, CBC News is reporting that this Conservative government's cuts to the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board have resulted in sexual abuse survivors no longer receiving the therapy they are entitled to. These cuts also mean that survivors of childhood abuse are no longer eligible to apply for funding for supports, Mr. Speaker. I am a survivor of child sexual abuse. One in three women will experience some form of sexual violence in their lifetime. That means that many women in this very legislature, MPPs and visitors, will be or are survivors of sexual violence. Uh, why is this government, Mr. Speaker, refusing to honour promises made to survivors of sexual abuse? Thank you. Members, please take their seats. Questions to the Premier. Attorney General. Or to the Attorney General. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Th th this is a serious area, and, and, and thank you for, for sharing that, the member from Toronto St. Paul's. It, it is critical that we provide resources immediately after violence. And so we have taken the VQRP program and doubled the funding from $6 million to $12 million to have the resources there for those people immediately after a violent incident. And the VQRP program, that $12 million, allows victims to receive supports, whether it be cell phones, fixing locks, immediate counselling, uh, residential. It, it's critical that we have those supports for them when they need them immediately. And, and we've, we've not only doubled it, what, what isn't widely known, Mr. Speaker, is that that allows them to not be out of pocket but that $12 million is not a cap limit. If the need is greater, we will increase the fund. And we've said that publicly on the record. It's not new right now. But Mr. Speaker, this is a critical issue that we have to be there for, for victims. And Response. we've expanded. Uh, I'll have more to add in my supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. 
supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is again for the Premier. And just to, just to state, gender-based violence, including sexual violence, disproportionately impacts women identifying people. I wanted to put that on record. Last night, we were contacted by a survivor of sexual violence, Kelly Grenier, who says that despite a signed settlement with the board, she can no longer access funding for therapy that is rightly hers. And no one in this Conservative government, Mr. Speaker, is picking up her calls. She doesn't know where to turn next. She and other survivors were never consulted or informed about these cruel and retroactive cuts. It's not too late for this Conservative government to do the right thing and reverse course. Mr. Speaker, my question is this. Why is this government so intent on re-victimizing Ontario's most vulnerable people. What does this Conservative government have against survivors of sexual violence, for goodness sakes? Thank you. Members, please take their seats. Questions have been referred to the Attorney General. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. And, and I, I want the opposition, I want the public to know how seriously we take victims of violence. It is, it is a critical issue, and, and I would like to tell you this, Mr. Speaker, uh, this is a personal issue for me as well. My mother was, was a counsellor. She was one of the founders of the York Region Victim Abuse Program that is still operating. Uh, I've been dealing with shelters and, and understanding that reality for a very long time, Mr. Speaker. This is not a new area of interest and, and, and passion for me. Let me tell you, Mr. Speaker, the Victim Quick Response Program that I spoke of has not only doubled the funding, not capped the funding, we've expanded services. Because we know things like human trafficking and, and it is such a heinous crime. And we know when people come out of those situations, that immediate aftermath of violence, that they need supports right away. Mr. Speaker, we have done some reforms to Response. deal with outdated programming, uh, that actually did re-victimize uh, individuals, and we're putting the resources in their hands immediately at every Order. turn. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier, and uh, I know he's mentioned this this morning, so I'm looking forward to his answer because I know he'll be anxious to uh, talk about this. So yesterday, Speaker, the uh, government introduced the following economic statement. And while the Minister of Finance uh, sang sweetly, and I might add in very dulcet tones, it's the same old song that we've heard before. Will the Premier tell us why he manufactured a phony $15 billion deficit and why he continues to— I'm going to ask the member to withdraw. I'll withdraw. Place his question. Phrase it. Will the Premier tell— this legislature, why there was a manufactured $15 billion deficit. <laughs> ask the member to withdraw. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw again. I withdraw. I was look to the Premier now to reply. Premier. No, he's got to sit down. He's got to sit down. No? Yes, well, well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I just can't believe what I just heard from the leader of the, the no-name party. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you know something? When we went in the election, we didn't know if the deficit was $3 billion, $5 billion, $10 billion, $15 billion. It was all over the place. But what we did do, Mr. Speaker, is something that they never did. We confirmed it with the Auditor General, third-party validation through an auditing firm. We confirmed it with the Finance Minister, the President of the Treasury, and we all agreed for the first time ever, we all agreed that it was a $15 billion disaster that the previous government left us on the backs of the people of Ontario, on the backs of the businesses. We've turned the corner here in Ontario. We're paying down our deficit. We're creating jobs like the likes of which this province has never, ever seen, 272,400 jobs. We have many more coming Lots. into this province. Mr. Speaker, we're we're on the right road to prosperity, to growth in this great province. The supplementary question, Member for Ottawa South again. I'd like to uh, thank the Premier for his answer, but I would like to remind him that the FAO said the deficit was never $15 billion. Public accounts, public accounts said 
apologize to the member for Ottawa South. The government side has to come to order now. Member for Ottawa South. The public accounts of this province said it was $7.4 billion. So we know, we know that that number was never real. So the reason Order. that the, the Premier and his colleagues did this was to create a context for cuts, cuts that hurt families in Ontario. We are spending less per student than we were before. Okay? We're going to spend less in post-secondary education and community and children's services in real dollars. And the Shameful. increase in health care, 2.3 percent, does not Question. even meet the standard. Shame. Oh, speaker, through you, why does the Premier continue to use a number and inflate a number that he knows is not right? Yeah. That's the same thing. You, you have to withdraw again. <laughs> I withdraw. The Premier to reply. The great Minister of Finance. <laughs> the Minister of Finance. Um, Mr. Speaker, and uh, let's um, let's talk about the record. Um, let's talk about taking over a government, Mr. Speaker, after 15 years where the Auditor General had refused, Mr. Speaker, to sign off on the books of the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, let's talk about the off-book accounting, Mr. Speaker, yeah. the accounting for hydro costs, Mr. Speaker. Of course, we brought in an independent um, financial commission. Mr. Speaker, that commission found that the deficit was $15 billion. Mr. Speaker, the member mentions the FAO. With the hard work of this government, the minister or the, uh, the <clears throat> FAO confirmed in May of, of uh, 2019 an 11.7 billion dollar deficit that's because of the hard work of yep. this government and mr speaker yesterday was very proud on behalf of this government and this premier to say that we are beating the target that Spons. we set in the last budget the 10.3 billion dollar deficit that we have had last year is now going to be 9 billion dollars mr speaker a 1.3 billion dollar reduction next question the member for carlton thank you mr speaker my question is for the Minister of Finance. Yesterday, we were thrilled to join the Minister and the Premier of Ontario in this House for the 2019 Fall Economic Statement. And Mr. Speaker, our Government for the People was elected with a mandate to restore confidence in Ontario's finances and put more money back in people's pockets. The Minister's statement made one thing very clear. Our plan is working. We are bringing relief to families and businesses in my riding of Carleton and across Ontario. And through you, Mr. Speaker, could the minister please elaborate on yesterday's exciting announcement and inform the House on our government's plan to finally bring our budget to balance? Thank you. Questions to the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Ottawa, Carleton. I know she does great work for her, uh, for her constituents. Mr. Speaker, yesterday I was pleased to announce our plan to build Ontario together and to speak, Mr. Speaker, to this House and to the people of Ontario about the progress that this government is making. Mr. Speaker, we were able to announce that we have made progress on the deficit that we inherited, that we have moved the deficit from $10.3 billion to $9 billion next year. Mr. Speaker, we were also able to announce that we are making $1.3 billion more of very important critical investments in the key, the key services that our province uh, requires. Mr. Speaker, our government is focused on making sure that we balance the budget by 2023, that we also invest in key services, and that we make a difference for the people of Ontario, and Response. that this province is the kind of home of prosperity that we know that it should be. Thank you. Member for Carleton, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his response. It's great to see that our government is continuing on our prudent and balanced plan to build Ontario together. And I can see that the vision put forward by our Premier when we were elected 16 months ago is becoming a reality. Thanks to our responsible fiscal management and our government's focus on making positive change for the people of Carleton and Ontario, we are seeing results. Could the minister please explain the approach our government is taking to solve the challenges we inherited due to 15 years of Liberal waste, management and neglect? Minister Finance, 
Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member. Mr. Speaker, we are taking a balanced and prudent approach. We are balancing three sets of priorities. We committed to put money back into people's pockets, and Mr. Speaker, we have put $3 billion back into the pockets of Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, we promised that we would put Ontario on a sound footing, and Mr. Speaker, we have reduced the de deficit down to $9 billion towards balancing that budget in 2023. And Mr. Speaker, we promised we would invest in critical public services like health care, education, and children. And Mr. Speaker, we increased that investment yesterday by $1.3 billion. This is the balanced, prudent approach we are taking. This is the approach that Ontarians expect. Thank you. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, they may be working hard to hide it, but under this government's watch, things keep going from bad to worse. No one knows that fact better than parents, teachers, and students across this province. Speaker, there is lead in the water, our schools are crumbling, and this government thinks the answer is cramming more kids in classrooms firing teachers, and gutting school budgets. My question is simple. Does the Premier still think balancing the budget on the backs of our students, staff, and families is a good idea? Questions addressed to the Premier. Minister of Education. Referred to the Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, it is this government that is investing over $13 billion over the next decade to improve schools, improve facilities in every region of Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, we're also investing this year alone over half a billion dollar allocation to improve the state of schools inherited from the former Liberal government after 15 years of dereliction of duty. Mr. Speaker, in addition, we are meeting the Auditor General's request or recommendation of 2.5 percent allocations to improve schools. But, Mr. Speaker, what is also Point is an acceptance. It is an acceptance, Mr. Speaker, that intergenerational debt is morally wrong. The transfer of debt from one generation onto the next is not an acceptable proposition for the very parents Order. we suggest we represent. Families in this province want us to invest in the front lines, keep taxes low, grow the economy, while doing what we do best, which is creating the conditions for young people to achieve their full potential in Ontario. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, you can put a new spin on these things, but it's the same old story. Seven schools in my community alone have been found to have unsafe levels of lead in the water, and there are thousands more across the province. So let's do the math, shall we? Fifteen years of liberal inaction resulted in a $15.9 billion school repair backlog. Now, in just over a year, the Government has grown that backlog to over 16.3 billion. That's about a that's about a half a billion dollars, and that doesn't even include the cost to remove the lead from our schools. Given that the fiscal update yesterday did nothing to fix the damage that this government has done in the year they've been in power, Question. when is the government going to do the right thing, reverse the cuts, and stop hurting our families? Minister of Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. It is under the Minister of Finance's leadership yesterday. He confirmed that we're, in fact, on track to spend $1.2 billion more than we did last year, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we announced in our last budget a $550 million investment to improve schools, $80 million to improve childcare facilities, because we accept after 15 years of the former Liberal government, there is so much more to do to support our kids in schools with better facilities. But, Mr. Speaker, what I said earlier, a billion dollars a month on interest, spending money that we do not have is not in the interest of the next generation. They want governments to live within their means. They want governments to set them up for economic success. Order. That's why we're growing the economy, so that we're able to invest more, as the Minister of Finance confirmed just yesterday. More money than ever before in the history of this province in health care and education and the social services that every family deserves. Response. Thank you. The next question, the member for Aurora, Oak Bridges, Richmond Hill. Yeah. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is also for the great Minister of Finance. As many of us in this House know, small businesses play an important role in our local communities. Small business owners are the people who make investments and create jobs right here in Ontario. For too long, these innovators and entrepreneurs were not set up for success by the previous government. With our plan to build Ontario together and by creating a more competitive business environment, those days are over, Speaker. 
We also have a plan to develop a small business success strategy, consulting with industry and business leaders to identify the needs of their businesses. Would the minister please inform the House about the steps of our fall economic statement and that we took to create a more competitive business environment? Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, and through you to the, the member from Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill, thank you for the question. Mr. Speaker, he is correct. Small businesses are the backbone of Ontario's economy. Mr. Speaker, they employ one third of private sector employees. Almost two million Ontarians drive their livelihood from small businesses. They also play a large part in our economy, making us more productive and more effective. And that's, Mr. Speaker, why we have proposed, as the uh, member mentioned, the Small Business Success Strategy, and we have also yesterday committed to following through on one of our important commitments. Mr. Speaker, yesterday we committed that we will be cutting the small business tax rate by 8.7 per cent in this uh, in this legislation to be tabled. Mr. Speaker, this is a promise made and a promise kept by this government. The supplementary question. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you for the minister for his response. It's reassuring to know that, if passed, the fall economic statement introduced yesterday will bring much needed and much deserved relief to small business owners. Speaker. In fact, small business owners in the ridings represented by every member in this House would stand to benefit. In addition to the action our government has already taken, could the minister please explain the great impact our proposed small business tax cut would have for small business owners? Minister Finance again. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member. Mr. Speaker, should should the uh, the bill pass, Mr. Speaker, this small business tax cut will represent up to $1,500 of relief annually for small businesses. This is in addition to the benefits that small businesses are already receiving from accelerated write-offs, from reduced WSIB premiums, from the elimination of the cap and trade carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, taken together, these tax measures will deliver over $255 million of Ontario income income tax relief to small businesses in 2020. Mr. Speaker, this is what small businesses need. This is what they deserve. They are our partners in prosperity, and we will support them from this side of the House. The next question, the member for Kiewetnong. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yesterday, I rose in the House to ask the Premier uh, about, the, about this government uh, was doing to honour its treaty obligations. But then I got my answer with the government's latest budget. There was hardly any mention of specific commitments to First Nations or Indigenous peoples in Ontario. But instead, there was, there was over $2 million less in base funding for Indigenous affairs. Premier, this government has already cut the budget for Indigenous affairs in half. Now another two million is being cut. Why is true and meaningful reconciliation not a priority for this government? Questions addressed to the Premier. Uh, associate Manager uh, of Energy, Minister of Energy. Referred to the Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Our government is working for all people in Ontario, including Indigenous communities. An important part of that is ensuring that the next generation of young people know the shared history, the culture, and the diversity of language that exists within First Nations communities of this province. So our government has expanded and enhanced education and learning of First Nations history from grades one to eight. It's why we've added 10 additional courses for secondary school students so they know more about the incredible contributions of First Nations. We share a passion for the opportunities of renewed economic prosperity with Indigenous peoples in Ontario. We believe there's tremendous economic opportunity and potential within our First Nations community, a fast-growing community in this province. We're going to continue to work with them in good faith to ensure that they're able to reach their full potential get economic opportunity and realize the dreams this country should be able to provide for the first peoples of our community. Mr. Speaker, we've engaged with community leaders from across the province and look forward to strengthening those relationships as we move forward with the plan. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, uh, this government has an obligation, uh, obligation to the first peoples of this land, but there are First Nations that have gone decades without clean, reliable drinking water. Mr. Speaker, clean, 
drinking water is a basic human right. Yeah. These communities call on you to be a, a better treaty partner. Yesterday, Metawa First Nations called on you to honor the treaties that govern their territories with respect to Bill 132. Speaker, reconciliation requires real resources yep. and real effort. Mm -hmm. Will the Premier restore the base funding for Indigenous Affairs mm -hmm. that he has cut since forming government? Yes or no? Members will please take their seats. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker. Questions been referred to the Associate Minister of Energy. Thank you very much, Speaker, and again to the member. Thank you. Uh, this is a very important issue. We inherited yet another issue Order. from the Liberals. They had 15 years to have taken action so that you wouldn't have to stand here today. And it's sad that they actually built our debt to $13 billion a year we spent in interest payments. That money could have gone to programs, services, and yes, clean water. The Minister of Indigenous Affairs, the great member from Kenora Rainy River, has a great relationship with many of the First Nation chiefs across our great province, and he's working hard to address these problems that we've inherited. He actually appointed Mr. Clifford Bull uh, to ensure that there is an opportunity for him to be a special advisor on Indigenous affairs. Mr. Bull has travelled throughout Northern Ontario and visited several communities to meet with Indigenous leaders and hear about the unique issues affecting Indigenous communities. We as the Government of Ontario are committed to working in partnership with Indigenous communities to promote economic opportunities, improve quality of life, and meet Ontario's legal Response. obligations. The funding that was there was one-time funding. We continue the base funding that is there, and I know Minister Rickford is going to do everything he can to work with members like Mr. Mamakwa to make sure that our Indigenous communities have the opportunity that we all have. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Speaker, Ontarians know about the dire fiscal situation we inherited from the previous government. It's been famously said, show me your budget and I'll show you my values. Sadly, under the previous government, those values were deeply misaligned as interest on the debt rose to the fourth largest line item. Yesterday, in the fall economic statement, the Minister of Finance outlined a number of important investments our government's making in health care, in education, in social ser services, and in children. Minister, could you please outline some of those important investments and please touch on some important investments we're making in health care? Questions to the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Northumberland, Peterborough South. Mr. Speaker, as has been said in this House, uh, $1.9 billion in additional spending. But, Mr. Speaker, I also know that uh, the member is a great advocate for the Northumberland Hills Hospital and the constituents there who I know are proud that he fights for them. You know, Mr. Speaker, working alongside the Ontario Hospital Association, the Ministry of Health was able to identify some long standing funding issues, Mr. Speaker, for small and medium sized communities. That's why our government has invested an additional $68 million. Mr. Speaker, to support small and medium-sized hospitals. That's in addition to the $384 million, Mr. Speaker, that hospitals receive in our budget. Our government is taking the steps, Mr. Speaker, to create healthy communities, to cut hospital waste times, and to get to the end of hallway health care. And we're doing it for small and medium communities Response. throughout Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for your answer, and thank you for touching on important health care funding, an area important to the people of my riding. Speaker, I was delighted to hear the $68 million our government allocated to small and medium-sized hospitals, $3.8 million of which went to Northumberland Hills Hospital in my riding. In addition, Mr. Speaker, we committed to fixing the funding formula for medium-sized hospital, which has, for decades, led to decreased funding in many medium-sized hospitals across rural Ontario. Mr. Speaker, this funding announcement has breathed new life into medium-sized hospitals across Ontario, new life into Northumberland Hills Hospital. And in the word of Dr. Andrew Stratford, one of my local surgeons, it's given them hope. Mr. Speaker, could the Minister of Health please outline more information on that important investment we made to fixing the medium-sized hospital funding formula. Thank you. The Minister of Finance and Minister of Health. Referred to the Minister of Health. Well, thank you very much to the member for 
the question. And in addition to our government's additional investment of $348 million for hospitals and the $68 million to support small and medium-sized hospitals, we have developed a comprehensive four-pillar plan to address hallway health care. First, through health promotion, we want to keep Ontarians healthy and out of hospitals. Secondly, hospitals aren't always the best place for a person to receive care. We will ensure that Ontarians receive the right care in the right place. Third, we are better integrating in care to improve the patient flow and ensure that patients who are ready to leave the hospital can do so with the care and support they need. And finally, by investing $27 billion over the next 10 years in hospital infrastructure projects, we will build capacity throughout the system, including in Response. our hospitals and other community-based facilities. Speaker, we made a commitment to the people to end hallway health care, and we are well on our way in that plan. Thank you. The next question, the member for St. Catharines. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Ontario Soldiers Aid Commission provides grants to veterans facing emergency, such as rent payments. However, most of the money under this program is never spent. This is because Ontario refuses to extend the program to veterans who serve after the Korean War. My question, will the Premier stop treating most of today's veterans as second class? and extend this program to all who have served. The question is addressed to the Premier. House Leader. Referred to the Government House Leader. Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. At the, uh, at the outset, uh, let me just uh, uh, thank the Honourable Member not only for the question, but uh, thank her for uh, uh, her, her words during, uh, before the before question period. And, uh, and uh, to let her know that, of course, we're all thinking of, uh, of her son and, and the great work uh, uh, that he does. Uh, the member's absolutely right. It is incumbent on this government and all legislators to make sure that we do everything that we can to live up to the spirit that we all talked about before question period, that we value the hard work of, uh, of our veterans, that we value those who serve us each and every day, and this government will remain committed to doing that, not only by providing funds and resources, but make, making sure that each and every day uh, we always take a moment to remember those who have sacrificed so hard. I know one of the things the Premier talked about almost immediately after election uh, was, uh, was a new memorial to those who uh, fought uh, uh, for us in Afghanistan, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. So we will continue to do that, and I thank the Honourable Member for that question. Supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's wonderful about a memorial wall, but we have homeless veterans that need the Ontario Soldiers Aid Commission. It is outrageous that 60% of the money allocated to help veterans facing emergency is never spent. This is because the provincial government treats some veterans as second-class citizens. There is nothing second-class about the service these brave men and women have provided for our country. Will the Premier end this second-class treatment? and extend the Soldiers' Aid Commission program to all veterans in Ontario. Right. Members, please take your seats. The question has been referred to the Government House Leader. Uh, to the Minister of Children, uh, Family and Social Services. And now referred to the Minister of Children, Community, Community and Social, Social Services. Services. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Actually, the Soldiers' Aid Commission falls within my ministry at Children, Community and Social Services. It actually sat idle uh, for 15 years, basically idle, uh, under the previous Liberal government. I can tell you we're taking this very seriously and modernizing how we're delivering the services out of the Soldiers' Aid Commission because we realize that this wasn't doing enough to help families in need. That's why over the last year we've seen some substantial gains in the services that we're providing to current military families. Uh, just last year, about this time, the Premier and myself and the Minister standing, uh, sitting right behind me made an announcement about the military hot Line that's now available for military family resource centers across the province and those families who are moving in and out of province to get the services that they need. We're modernizing the way we deliver the Soldiers' Aid Commission. We are going to have some very exciting announcements in the very near future. No one in this party treats our military members as second-class citizens. There are heroes, Mr. Speaker. We stand up for them every time. Thank you. Stop the clock. Order. 
restart the clock. The next question, the member for Oakville North, Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. I was so pleased to be in the House yesterday and hear the Minister deliver our fall economic statement for this year. It is clear our government has a plan for the people of Ontario and for the future of our province, and that plan is working. I was particularly gratified to see the contributions of Canada's more than 270,000 people of Hellenic descent be recognized through the inclusion of Hellenic Heritage Month in the plan to build Ontario Together Act. Could the minister please share with the House the details of this schedule of the proposed bill? Questions addressed to the Minister of Finance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Oakland, Oakville, Burlington, North Burlington. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, if passed, the bill would declare March of every year Hellenic Heritage Month in Ontario. It would be an opportunity to recognize how Ontarians of Hellenic descent have contributed to every field of life of our province, have enriched our culture, and have strengthened our economy. As the member for Oakville Burlington North has advocated in this House before, Hellenic Canadians have made contributions to many fields, including education, law, science, entrepreneurship, business, and sport. Mr. Speaker, should the bill pass, I look forward, as I know all of the members of our caucus look forward, to celebrating Hellenic Heritage Month with all of the members of the Legislature. The supplementary question, the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you for the Minister for his answer to my colleague question. As the first provincial member of uh, Parliament from Egyptian origin, in the country's history, I am so proud of our government, our premier, and our minister of finance for recognizing the contribution of Canadian Egyptians throughout yesterday's full uh, economic statement. I'm looking forward to celebrate our culture and our contributions with all members of this legislature should our bill pass. The passage of Egyptian Heritage Month would give us all the opportunity to recognize the significant contributions of Egyptian origins had made right across our province. Could the minister please share with the House the details of the proposed schedule in this bill? Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you to the member from Mississauga, Aaron Mills. If passed, the Plan to Build Ontario Together Act would proclaim July as Egyptian Heritage Month in Ontario. It would give the members of this House and people right across Ontario the opportunity to recognize the valuable contributions Egyptian Canadians have made and are making to our province. Contributions like the ones made by the member himself, Aaron Mills, who continues to give back to his community and future generations as a member of the Legislature. Mr. Speaker, I hope that all members of this House will join the government in supporting this important recognition of Egyptian Canadians to Ontario's prosperity, culture, and our future success. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Davin Hill is a retirement home in University Rosedale. In July, Davin Hill abruptly said it was closing. The land was sold for millions to a numbered company, and over 150 vulnerable seniors were told they had to leave and find more expensive homes. Some of these people are here today, like Anne Washington and Betty Robinson. Betty is 97 years old and lives at Davin Hill. She doesn't want to leave, and she's fighting this forced removal as best she can. But Davin Hill is calling her incessantly asking her when she's going to leave. They're closing entire floors, they're threatening to cancel meal programs, and they're even selling the furniture, even though Betty has never been served with an official eviction notice. Oh, Speaker, how can the minister allow seniors to be treated like this in Ontario? The minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for raising that important question. As a minister for seniors, First of all, I'd like to express my uh, uh, sorry for the, the residents there for the causing so inconvenience. And I got the report from the report uh, from the uh, uh, Retirement Home Authority, authority. and uh, they told me that the, 
the, the home actually didn't provide safe and secure environment for the seniors. That's why the home is closed and uh, now the, the firefighters and the municipalities and the, all the community agency working very hard to make sure the residents in that home will be properly placed. So they're doing working very, very hard. Response. Thank you for the question. I'll answer more. Thank you very Thank much. You. The supplementary Thank question. Thank you. Uh, back to the minister. This summer, I wrote to the minister asking for a review of the Retirement Homes Act to better protect seniors like those in Davin Hill. A retirement home is currently allowed to stop providing basic services to seniors, like meals and nursing, whenever they want, or increase the prices when they feel like it. And seniors, I believe, like Betty and Anne, deserve better. When they move into a retirement home, they should have more rights when it comes to the care services they're paying for and better protections from eviction. The minister responded by saying the act is just fine as it is. My question, Mr Speaker, is how can the minister think that the Retirement Homes Act is working when it means that vulnerable seniors are cut off from basic services at any time and forced to leave their homes? Minister, reply. Thank you for the question again. And uh, it's a very important question. Uh, our ministry worked very hard to make sure that their residents uh, stay in retirement home, they get the uh, safe and proper uh, treatment from the home. And that's why the, the retirement home uh, authority, they send the inspectors uh, regularly uh, and they make sure that the retirement home do the proper job as the Retirement Act uh, made it clear. And uh, if any, any specific concern, you could always call me and I will directly contact the Retirement Authority to make sure that the seniors in the retirement home, they live in the safe and the proper environment and they could always Response. participate through their board. If they have any concern, they could express that. And I make sure I work very hard for the, all the seniors in Ontario, especially in retirement home. And th thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the minister who is helping protect what matters most for future generations, the Minister of Finance. Yesterday, this minister released our government's plan to build Ontario together in his fall economic statement. I was pleased to see the investments he is taking in our health care, education and social services, all these core social pillars that cannot be maintained without sound fiscal stewardship. In protecting what Ontarians value most, it's important to listen. It's important to understand that we need to empower Ontarians to take more action, both for their economy and for their environment. And we are listening. We're listening to when they talk to us about matters preserving and protecting their environment for today and for future generations. And we're taking positive steps, positive steps like uh, making sure polluters pay, but we're not going to be making sure that small businesses are, are, are paying the brunt of it or that families are gouged at the so I wanted to talk about earlier this year and how I tabled a private member's bill on combating litter, encouraging all communities to get to come together. I wanted the minister to elaborate on how our fall economic statement is making this happen. Much. Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Barry Innisville for that question. Mr. Speaker, Ontario does need to divert more waste from landfills. And I referenced in my comments yesterday the great work being done by our Minister of the Environment in terms of the first producer pay system for this province, long avoided by the previous government, but there's going to make a big difference in that. But Mr. Speaker, we need to do everything we can to divert from landfill. We need to do everything we can to educate our, everyone about the importance of that. And that's why I'm so pleased to share with, with this House that should it be passed, this, uh, this, this initiative of the Ontario's first day of action on litter that was put forward by the member from uh, Barry Innisfil will help to educate our young people, help to educate all of us about the importance of this, and that the first annual day of action on litter will be May the 12th, 20, 20, 20, 2020. Mr. Speaker, Response. we look forward to working with all of our partners. We look forward with, with all of our partners on both sides of the House to make this day an incredible success. Thank you. The supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I want to thank the minister for his uh, response in making a, a, a very key, uh, but making it a key priority to gather all communities, unite all communities, to make sure that we're taking action on litter all across this province through public education and awareness of the significant environmental challenges that are key component to building confidence in our environment and confidence in our communities. By taking action together uh, and taking action on litter, we can unite communities, kids, and education systems to take real strong leadership on the environment, and including the economic side, which is the circular economy element on ensuring that our waste is cleaned up. So I want to ask the minister to elaborate a little more on the circular economy and how this private member's bill is going to be helping the environment and the economy and our future generations. Mr. Pants. Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you again to the MPP from Barrie Innisville for this question and for her leadership on this issue. Mr. Speaker, our government has been clear, and the Minister of Environment said it in this House today, that we need to balance a healthy economy and a healthy environment. Our improved Blue Box program, the producer pay program that the Minister of Environment has introduced, will significantly increase the recycling rates in Ontario. It will keep plastic out of our lakes, our rivers and streams, and it will save taxpayers money. Mr. Speaker, the litter day of action that we are proud to have in this bill will make all of Ontarians aware of the importance of collecting litter in our community. Mr. Speaker, environmentalism begins at home, it begins in our communities, and the annual day of action on litter will make that very clear across our province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This week is Skilled Trades Week in Ontario. It's very concerning that these Conservative government continues to re reduce safety of skilled trade workers in our province. Companies try to lower costs by cutting corners on safety, like not ensuring employees on work sites have the proper training and certification. This summer, we saw a tragic consequences of unsafe workplaces. An 18-year-old, Vadim, Buxell, an unregistered electrician with only three months of college training employed by Nord Electric, was electrocuted to death on the job site. He was left alone to die, assigned to do work he wasn't certified to do. This should never have happened. Badham's family is devastated by this strategy. Badham's mother was hugging his teddy bear as he died at the hospital. Is this the type of work environment the Premier wants in Ontario for our skilled trade workers and our young people to enter the trades? Minister of College and Universities. Question addressed to the Premier. It's been referred to the Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you uh, for the question. And uh, our condolences uh, go out to, to the family of uh, the, uh, the individual who, who lost his life. We take safety in the workplace so incredibly seriously, Mr. Speaker. It is so critical, important, uh, critically important, and we are working very diligently as a government to ensure that we are putting every measure in place. In fact. I could tell you personally, from my own perspective, I've addressed this uh, issue in my own family, a, a family uh, member who lost his life in the line of work, uh, working for uh, the city of Sault Ste. Marie in uh, April 16th of 2009, in fact. This is an incredibly serious matter to us all. It matters greatly to us. We are going to work hand in hand to ensure that we can do everything in our power to promote safety in the workplace. We want to get more people coming into the trades, but we want to make sure that when they come in, they have a safe place to work, a place that they are going to ensure that they are going to go home to their families at the end of every night. That matters to us as, matters, as, as much as it matters to everyone here. So again, to the family, our condolences, and we are working diligently with our Minister of uh, Labour and Training Development, as well as with our Premier and every member of our caucus. And we're going to work hand in hand with every person in Ontario to make sure that we get our people, our workers, Fair safely home every night. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning and for the week. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Toronto St. Paul's has given notice of 
her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Attorney General concerning victim compensation services. This matter will be debated Tuesday, November 19, at 6 p.m. I understand that the Minister of Government and Consumer Services has a point of order. Thank you very much, Speaker. Yesterday, in my response to the member from Lanark, Frontenac and Kingston, I stated that we're acting on 27 recommendations from Justice Cunningham, and I would like to correct my record because, in fact, we're actually acting on 32 out of the 37. Thank you very much. The member from Milton inform me he has a point of order. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm rising on a point of order to recognize an important milestone, milestone uh, in the life of our, one of our colleagues, the hardworking Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, and want to wish him happy 21st birthday, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> permitting the introduction of guests after question period, but we are permitting recognition of people's birthdays, it seems. <laughs> Happy birthday. I'm going to now ask our pages to assemble. great group of pages. They've only been here two weeks, but they've done a superb job. They are smart, trustworthy, and hardworking. They are indispensable to the effective functioning of the chamber. They cheerfully and efficiently deliver notes, run errands, transport important documents throughout the precinct, and make sure that our water glasses are always full. We are indeed fortunate to have them here. Our pages depart, having made many new friends with a greater understanding of parliamentary democracy and memories that will last a lifetime. Each of them will go home and carry on, continue their studies, and no doubt will contribute to their communities, their province, and their country in important ways. We expect great things from all of them. Maybe some of them someday will take their seats in this House as members or work here as staff, and we wish them all well. Please join me in showing our appreciation to our legislative pages. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Premier concerning the deficit. This matter will be debated Tuesday, November 19, 2019, at 6 p.m. We have a deferred vote on Government Notice of Motion No. 69, relating to the allocation of time on Bill 132, an act to reduce burdens on people and businesses by enacting, amending and repealing various acts and revoking various regulations. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.
members will please take their seats. Members will please take their seats. On November the 6th, 2019, Mr. Fidelli moved government notice of motion number 69 relating to allocation of time on Bill 132. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Kalan. Mr. Mr. Young. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Lecce. Mr. Ford. Mr. Ford. Ms. Elliott. Ms. Elliott. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Mr. Bethan Paul. Mr. Bethan Paul. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Mr. Smith Bay of Quinty. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Tabola. Mr. Tabola. Ms. Dunlop. Ms. Dunlop. Mr. Romano. Mr. Romano. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Downey. Mr. Downey. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Fullerton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Sarkari. Mr. Sarkari. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Mr. Cho Scarborough North. Ms. Sermon. Ms. Sermon. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Ms. Kanji. Ms. Kanji. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Cho Willowdale. Mr. Gill. Mr. Gill. Ms. McKenna. Ms. McKenna. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Parson. Mr. Parson. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Pacini. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Ostroff. Mr. Tanny Gaslin. Mr. Tanny Gaslin. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Baber. Mr. Baber. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Kusindova. Ms. Kusindova. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Tangri. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Wise. Mrs. Carahalios. Mrs. Carahalios. Ms. Park. Ms. Park. Mr. Gazzetto. Mr. Gazzetto. Mr. Pang. Mr. Pang. Mr. Mr. Anthony Philopolis. Mr. Anthony Philopolis. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Crawford. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Cramp. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Rashid. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Bauman. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Court. Mr. Smith, Peterborough Court. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Roberts. Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Sandy. Mr. Anand. Mr. Anand. Ms. Gamari. Ms. Gamari. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Kanapathy. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Babikian. Mr. Sabawi. Mr. Sabawi. All those opposed to the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Madame Gellin. Madame Gellin. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Ms. Singh Brampton Center. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Tabins. Mr. Tabins. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Shaw. Ms. Shaw. Mr. Mamakwa. Mr. Mamakwa. Ms. Begum. Ms. Begum. Mr. Yard. Mr. Yard. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Styles. Ms. Styles. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. Kernahan. Mr. West. Mr. West. Mrs. Stevens. Mrs. Stevens. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. French. Mr. French. Mr. Miller Hamilton East. Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Mr. Singh Brampton East. Ms. Andrew. Ms. Andrew. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Birch. Mr. Birch. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Burns McGowan. Mr. Borgwan. Mr. Borgwan. Ms. Bell. Ms. Bell. Mr. Glover. Mr. Glover. Ms. Morrison. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Rakosovic. Mr. Hardy. Mr. Hardy. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Ms. Monteith Farrell. Mr. Assange. Mr. Assange. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Schreiner. Mr. Schreiner. Mademoiselle Samard. Mademoiselle Samard. The ayes are 64, the nays are 41. The ayes being 64 and the nays being 41, I declare the motion carried. This House stands in recess until 1 p.m.